For a few years now, both China and Russia have boasted of having hypersonic missiles in active service. The US has no such weapons yet. But it is working on a plethora of various systems to be put into service in the coming years. This video will try to list them all, explain them, compare them and put them all in a proper context. So when might the US catch up in the hypersonic missile race? Watch the video to find out. Let's get back to our video. One thing to get out of the way. Yes, many ballistic missiles achieve hypersonic speeds during their flight. Getting past Mach 5 isn't that hard. However, the modern term hypersonic missiles refers specifically to missiles maintaining hypersonic speeds while being controllable and highly maneuverable. That's something ballistic missiles can't really do. That's what makes their trajectory unpredictable and that is why hypersonic missiles are such a threat. Indeed, it's only after China and Russia actually started fielding their systems that the US really woke up and started pumping hundreds of millions into developmental programs of its own. It wasn't always like that, of course. Back during the late Cold War, the US was at the forefront of hypersonic missile research, alongside the Soviet Union. Hypersonic gliders were researched back then, but as the Cold War ended, so did the impetus to actually get serious about such research. Some development did continue, however, and in the aughties there were some projects such as Fast Hawk missile or the High Fly missile. Basically, all those programs were seen as wasteful and unneeded. Back then, the effort they required was not met by the actual threat to use such weapons against. All the while, however, China and Russia got serious about their hypersonics. Each seems to have fielded at least two systems, though the number of additional systems in development may be and likely is higher. So after basically decades of low funding, the US military finally took notice of their adversary's systems a decade ago. DARPA tested hypersonic gliders with their HTV-1 and 2 projects around 2010. The Army had a hypersonic weapon project which got fairly little funding in the 80s and finally managed to do a test flight in 2011. Yet serious money and serious developmental projects didn't really start forming until several years ago when it was obvious both Russia and China were on the cusp of fielding their first systems. So the US is now playing catch-up. Though it's not developing just one or two systems, it seems to be bent on deploying a plethora of various hypersonic missiles, to be used by the Army, the Navy and the Air Force. Some to be used as theater-level weapons and some to be tactical-level weapons. So let's start our overview of just what US programs are out there starting with ones most likely to be fielded first. Though the very first one to be mentioned has very recently become questionable. The US Air Force has the air-launched rapid response weapon. It features a large rocket booster onto which a hypersonic glider warhead is attached to. In a sense, it's similar to the Chinese DF-17, though this weapon is of course air-launched and made to be more compact. The US Air Force also had the hypersonic conventional strike weapon, which is a system using a common glider body in development up to 2020, but it ended that program as it lacked funds to pursue both programs. So the more compact and, in their words, more advanced aero glider was deemed more important. The Air Force's glider uses a blended body design, like the Chinese glider. The common Navy and Army glider, now without the Air Force participation, uses a biconical body. The latter is more controllable, but is somewhat slower and achieves a bit less range. But more about the Army and Navy's glider in a minute. The most useful feature of the Arrow, according to the Air Force, is exactly its relatively small size. It is hoped a B-52 will be able to carry 20 such missiles. And that even tactical jets like the F-15 will be able to carry one, one day. So that offers a lot of tactical flexibility to the Air Force. Being fairly compact, it's not a very long-ranged weapon. US Air Force General Andrew Jibara stated the following. This thing is going to be able to go almost a thousand miles in 10 to 12 minutes. That suggests the weapon would travel at speeds of up to 6,000 miles per hour and strike a target that's a thousand miles away within 12 minutes. That suggests speeds of close to Mach 8 initially and likely dropping to Mach 6 or less in the terminal flight stage. 
The quote also suggests almost a thousand miles is indeed the weapon's maximum range. 1600 kilometers makes it similarly ranged as the future JASM air launch cruise missile variant, and it will almost reach the range of Tomahawk missiles in some mission profiles. The warhead is fairly small though, so even with the kinetic energy added from the high velocity, the impact on target is not likely to be comparable to the Chinese DF-17 glider warhead, but it will likely have a similar effect to a Tomahawk warhead. A Congressional Budget Office report said that a production run of 300 missiles should yield an average cost of $15 million per missile. That's roughly 10 to 15 times the cost of a JASM missile. During 2021 and 2022, missile was tested six times, of which two tests failed. But more crucially, another important test this March failed. While previously serial production was probably planned for 2024, after the latest failed test, Air Force acquisition chiefs said they don't currently intend to pursue follow-on procurement of the Arrow once the prototyping program concludes, so the Arrow program may be finished, or it may help future similar programs. As said, the Army's long-range hypersonic weapon might also come into service fairly quickly. The missile itself is shared with the Navy, which is leading the development of the project. Both services will use the same booster rocket and the same glider vehicle. The same one the Air Force passed on. Missiles will come in sealed containers and two such containers will come per launcher trailer, to be towed by trucks. Four such launchers will make up one battery. 5th Battalion 3rd Field Artillery Regiment is the first unit to operate the type. It will get the prototype battery. There have been some failed tests in 2021 and 2022, and the weapon system is currently being inspected by the DoD Inspector General. But if all goes well and previous plans are adhered to, which is always questionable, that first prototype battery may be fielded before the end of this year. A second battery would be added in 2025, and a third one in 2027 suggesting serial production of missiles to begin sometime in 2024 or so. The system itself is quite complex and expensive. Office of the Secretary of Defense Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation estimated that a 66 missile production run would yield an average cost of 106 million per missile. The Congressional Budget Office had a different cost estimate, made on a larger missile production run of 300 missiles total cost being $41 million per missile. That massive price tag is applicable for the same missile, both for the Army and the Navy. The Navy's variant is called the Conventional Prompt Strike System. It was initially scheduled to be launched from submarines only, but recently news came that the Navy will test it from a modified Zumwalt destroyer. The US Navy has three of those, though one hasn't even been commissioned into service yet. That ship will undergo modifications which will see its deck gun installations removed. Those guns never reached operational service. In their place, vertical launch missile tubes will be installed. The tubes themselves are payload flexible. In this instance, three hypersonic missiles will fit in each. In total, the Zumwalt will be able to carry up to 12 such missiles. If everything goes okay with testing, the Navy plans to modify the remaining two Zumwalts the same way in the years to come. And it is also possible, even likely, that the whole project is used as testing grounds for the next generation Navy destroyer. It was often mentioned that Burke's successor would be able to carry large diameter hypersonic weapons. But before that happens, the Navy plans to install the CPS missiles onto its submarines. First to its four Ohio-class submarines, which have been reconfigured to carry Tomahawk cruise missiles. With this, those subs will get a second weapon option. Initial plans called for operational capability on Ohio's in 2025, but that timetable seems to have slipped by at least a year. Given that Ohio's tubes are even slightly larger than the tubes to be installed on the Zumwalt, it's plausible those two will be able to hold three missiles each, for a total of 66 hypersonic missiles per Ohio, in theory. In practice, due to costs, who knows how many would an Ohio usually hold? Finally, as the US Navy plans to introduce Virginia-class attack submarines with even more VLS modules, those subs will get hypersonic missile capability as well. Those will be installed in Block 5 Virginia subs, which will be over 80 feet longer than Block 1 subs. The added launch modules will be of greater height, supporting the long hypersonic missiles. 
each Block 5 Virginia would then be able to carry 12 such missiles. While early plans called for hypersonic missile integration on Virginias by 2028, with slippage of those plans, that may happen a bit later. The four Ohios will eventually be replaced by Virginia Block 5s. The missile itself, the Army and Navy one, is really very similar in class and usage to the Chinese DF-17, with perhaps a bit more range as the booster is a bit bigger. Of course, actual parameters defining its effectiveness are classified. China also has the DF-27, sporting an even larger booster, which has an even greater range. All those missiles mentioned so far are finishing up their development, so a fair bit of info is known about them. But there are other programs which either still have a lot of development to be done, or are more secretive. There is the Air Force's hypersonic cruise missile, to be launched from tactical planes such as the F-15 which means the goal is to make it more compact than the Russian Circon missile, for example, which is also an air-breathing cruise missile. Not much is known about said missile, though it's very likely it's leveraging development from the Hawk program, which concluded in 2022. It's also possible that the Air Force is joining forces with the Navy, developing one missile for both services. The Navy has had a crash course development project called the Offensive Anti-Surface Warfare, through which it took a JASA missile, used by the Air Force as a cruise missile, and turned it into an anti-ship missile, calling it the El Rasm. That weapon is already in service. Well, there is now a program called Offensive Anti-Surface Warfare Increment 2, and it seeks to quickly develop and field an even more potent anti-ship weapon. It also has a more pronounceable name, Halo, which discloses it's really a hypersonic weapon. Finally, the Air Force said its hypersonic cruise missile has anti-ship capability. Given Navy's and Air Force's cooperation on the El Rasm, it's also plausible those two programs, Halo and Hackem, share the basic missile tech. The Navy plans to use its missile from Super Hornets, so it all points to a very similar missile. It's quite possible the two are one and the same missile, like Army's and Navy's common hypersonic glider mentioned earlier. With today's technology, a multi-role missile is not hard to make. The Russian Sircon missile is, for example, to be used both against naval and ground targets. The US missiles are sized to be carried in pairs, two per aircraft. It also points to a missile of less range than the Russian Sircon, given its fairly small size. Actual program timetables are, however, not very well defined. The Air Force has expressed desire to have the Hackam complete its development in 2027, while the Navy said it wants to field Halo in 2028. As fielding usually happens a bit after development completion, those dates point to inter-service cooperation as well. Various other programs exist, like the follow-up to the Hawk missile research, but those will develop fundamental new technologies for a future generation of hypersonic missiles, likely to be fielded after 2030. In the meantime, another project that may see service fairly soon is Opfires. Right now, it's just a developmental project. The US DARPA agency is the lead on that, but with the US Army being the interested party, should the program demonstrate feasibility. The aim of Opfires is to produce a cheaper hypersonic weapon to be fired from regular army trucks. Cheaper than the large LRHW, but still pricey. It reuses the glider warhead from the Air Force's aero system and mates it to a new booster. The booster itself is throttleable, so if a not so distant target emerges, the glider will detach fairly soon after launch. Its maximum reach was described to be around a thousand miles. Development started fairly late in 2017, and 2022 saw its first and only test. Curiously, DARPA claims the development is over. Whether that means the project will not see service remains to be seen. Earlier, DARPA's program manager did mention that the system could be made ready for service in the late 2020s, if pursued further. But it remains to be seen if the Army will actually pick up that program. That's because the Army has yet another possibly hypersonic program up its sleeve. It has the Precision Strike Missile. In its Increment 1 variant, it will be rocket motor powered and will replace the Attackums missile. But already another weapon option is being developed, Precision Strike Missile Increment 4, 
which will use a ramjet motor and extend the range to a thousand kilometers. Now, being ramjet powered, it's quite possible said system will not actually be hypersonic during most of its trajectory, and depending on other details, it may not even be sufficiently maneuverable at high enough altitude to be called a hypersonic missile. In a sense, it may be like Russian Iskander or Kinzhal missile. While somewhat maneuverable, they're not really true hypersonic missiles. But such weapons, precision strike missile included, do offer adequate range and some defense evasion capabilities for a much lower price tag. Showing that hypersonic weapons are not be-all and end-all assets. Price tags of hypersonics mentioned earlier show that as well. While all these missile programs are certainly flashy, Hypersonics are just one arrow in a quiver of modern military power. A silver arrow indeed, made to break down certain doors and help cheaper weapons to come in and survive, but they are not to be used on their own. Thanks for watching. We hope you liked this video and its visual style. We like to mix it up a bit, not being confined to a single visual style for our videos. Also, did you notice we are again making YouTube shorts? We'll try releasing those on Wednesdays, since we recently moved our feature videos to Sundays. Until next time, salutations! And remember, Binkov may talk about war, but only real peace can bring us all together.